Good afternoon and uh, welcome to Camera 2.0. So um, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to get a feel from the audience. Uh, how many people here uh, work with the camera APIs? How many people have tried to bring up a new image sensor on hardware? Okay. And so what are you looking for? What any particular interest? Somebody who's never dealt with cameras at all? Anybody totally new? Excellent. So we'll try to make it so we can um, cover, give you a background, and then go deep dive into uh, the camera 2.0, which is the new hardware interface layer. So before we start, welcome once again. Uh, I'm Balvinder Kaur, and um, I work with Aptina. I've been there about um, a year and a half. Been doing Android since 2009. I was at T-Mobile before that. Um, I uh, have a lot of background in mobile uh, software and apps, but not so much as camera till I came to Aptina. And I used to really think that, oh, it's this tiny little thing and it takes a picture. But um, I'm quite amazed at everything that goes into it and how complex it is. Um, and we have, um, so Aptina builds uh, image sensors, we have our image uh, coprocessor, and we also have our Android uh, camera stack. And some of the things we're talking are experiences based on bringing up our own sensors. And uh, I have Ashutosh who's uh, flown in from uh, India just to be here with us today. Uh, hello, good afternoon everybody. Welcome again for this talk. Uh, I am Ashutosh, working with, so my, uh, I'm working with Aptina and Android for the last three years. And prior to that, I was at uh, Samsung Electronics and I worked on a range of multimedia devices over there. So yes, we'll be talking about camera 2.0. Thanks, Ashutosh. Okay, so uh, our agenda today, we'll generally talk about the camera use cases since it's an embedded uh, Android uh, summit. Uh, we're not going to uh, uh, focus too much on the API part of it and the SDK part of it, uh, but we'll go briefly over what the different classes are and what's available to an application developer. Uh, focus a little bit about on the camera service. Now with uh, Jelly Bean 4.2, the camera service got re-architected in a big way. There are still no implications at the application layer or um, the APIs that are available. But we will talk about what the new architecture is. After that, um, well, I'll hand it over to Ashutosh, and he's going to cover everything that's below the HAL. So what's the new interface, the architecture of the uh, camera 2 HAL, what does it look like, uh, device drivers, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges that typically whenever we bring up a new image sensor on a new platform are things we run into. Lastly, we'll talk about some of the emerging trends uh, in this industry and uh, where we think uh, it's going, uh, the future is going to be. Uh, hopefully, we'll have time left for Q&A at the end. So what are the prominent use cases? Very simply, once you have a camera and a device, you need to be able to do a live preview. So whatever you see, a viewfinder, basically. Sometimes, not only do you need the uh, view, you also need to be able to provide. That typically goes right from the image sensor to the display subsystem. It doesn't go back up to the application developer. But sometimes de developers want to do things with it, so a copy of the preview frame back up to the application developer. Then we have the ability to capture a frame. That's what the most uh, common use case of an image sensor is. I'll talk about a little bit about the uh, emerging field of uh, computer embedded computer vision, where image sensors are not necessarily used for getting images, but also as a means of getting information, especially for the context-aware phones. Finally, we have video recording of a camera stream. Then there are other secondary use cases. Basically, at this point, everything, think of a point-and-shoot camera or a little bit more controlled. What are the different scenes available? Can I set the scene? Is it a sports scene? Is it a night scene? Can I um, put any filters on it? The new feature that uh, came out with Ice Cream Sandwich was the ability to take a snapshot during video recording. Finally, we have the different event callbacks. Okay, the shutter was clicked. 
the, if the application developer wants to do something special at that time, they should be able to do it. Focus was achieved. Um, so these are the different callbacks that the uh, camera subsystem provides to the application developer. And then finally are the information related use cases. As of today, there are very few classes and very few, uh, very little metadata that is provided to the application developer. The most common is the face class, which will tell you how many faces were detected in the scene, uh, what is the confidence level that it is a face, what is the, what is the location of the eyes, uh, what, what is the location of the smile. So metadata of an image. But like I said, it's very uh, limited. With 4.2, there's a lot of plumbing that has been done and a lot of emphasis on being able to provide metadata right up to the application layer. There are limitations with this camera API. So if you have any of the Android phones, the HTC, Samsung, you'll see that their camera applications can do a lot of features which there are no APIs for it. For example, burst mode photography, which is very common. Um, you could have continuous burst where you start the shutter button and it keeps taking pictures till you release it. Or you can have a time. You take a shutter and it takes three bursts in succession. There's no support for panoramic short, uh, shots. Um, then there's no frame data, like if there's no frame metadata that is available. If I want to know that there's a frame, a, a frame was taken, but what was the exposure with it? What was the focus with it? There's none of that information is available right now. There's no par frame control of the camera. So to back this up a little bit, this whole thing about camera 2.0, there's a lot of research that was done at Stanford, and you can search for FCAM or camera 2.0, and there they describe a lot of the use cases of what they would like to do with the camera. Um, for example, HDR, which is high dynamic range. So many times, I'm sure you've taken pictures where something is in the shade and it's unclear, and then there's, it, so there's sunlight and a, a, a something under a tree and that's not clear. So high dynamic range, what they do is they take multiple shots at different exposures and then they stitch them together. Same thing with flash and no flash. You could have a scene, for example, a person is sitting in the dark and there's lights outside. You want the flash to be on the person, but you also want those lights at the back. So the ability to combine flash and no flash together. There are multiple range of uh, applications that can only be achieved with per frame control. See, for this frame, I want the exposure to be this, I want the gain to be this. Then there are other things. Um, whatever you get back, from the uh, camera subsystem is three callbacks. You can get what is called post view callback. There's a JPEG callback and a raw callback. I haven't still seen any device where you can actually get raw callback. I could be mistaken, but I haven't seen one. So it's not very common. JPEG is one, the one that is common. But you can do a lot of things if you get the raw um, information from an image sensor. So all of these things are still uh, missing. So now just to give a little bit of overview of what APIs we have currently, there are six classes. Out of this, the most interesting ones are camera and camera.parameters. There are eight callback interfaces, and the one at the bottom is in uh, yellow because it was the latest one introduced with 4.2. The rest are all 4.1 and previous. So out of this, camera gives the capability to open a camera, close a camera, uh, have access to the camera controls. You set up a preview, and of course you can take um, you take a picture. The camera parameters class is a huge class with a lot of different um, API methods. So to help understand with this, there are three categories of API. Most of the APIs will fall in. Some of them is the mandatory feature set, which, is have, which are typically named like get supported preview size, get preview supported preview formats. They have the supported. That means every camera 
on Android subsystem needs to provide certain mandatory features. There are gets and sets for those. And then there is the optional feature set. Things like uh, is video stabilization available? Now, just because there are APIs available doesn't necessarily mean that the whole uh, stack is functional. You could have hardware that doesn't support it. You could have um, uh, you could have hardware that supports it, but maybe you haven't done the correct plumbing in the camera HAL, and it's not available to the end user. So these are runtime calls. And typically, an application developer would do at runtime and say, is this feature supported? And if it is, then you can go and enable whatever you want to do uh, from the UI perspective. Finally, there's also a dump pipe that is available. And we use this a lot internally to provide our own features. For example, I mentioned that Burst is not available, but we have our own Burst extension. Um, there are other things that are not available which we provide. And so we use this dump pipe, and basically it's just providing string parameters. Um, it's, you can query the system for what string is available, but it's very OEM dependent. Somebody really has to know that the implementation of the camera, how it will not be a generic um, solution. And then the rest of the camera classes, which I already mentioned uh, briefly earlier. Now moving on to the camera two internals. These got released as, uh, so one of the first bis, uh, big disclaimers I would like as we move into this section is that the only documentation that we have is actually reading all the Android open source uh, code and picking up things from uh, trying to figure out what the design is, trying to look at the what the method names are, the um, comments that are there. So one, it's uh, so you have to. There's no document which kind of defines all of this. So that's one thing to be cautious of. Second is right now there is no APIs available at the SDK. So the next version of Android could very well go and change some of these. So just something to be cautious of uh, in case you're going to go back and refer to this, pu this part. Now, this was when I first uh, started, when 4.2 got released and I started looking at it, I saw all these references to camera 2. There was a camera 2.h. There was a lot of classes. And then I started wondering which application was using it. But turns out there is no application that is using these features as of now. Not even the closed source Photosphere that was released, uh, the Google app that was released with uh, 4.2. The HAL implementation that came, uh, that was open source was the Samsung Xenos 5 based, and we'll talk about it later during the talk. And um, this reference to android.hardware.pro camera actually came from one of the comments there, which kind of indicated that that's what they're trying to do with camera two, is provide very fine-grained control. So very briefly, um, I'll go over, I'm sure everybody here in this room has seen this uh, cake diagram. So the, we'll, uh, I'll be focusing on the camera hal and where it sits. So it's that little piece in the hardware abstraction layer, and uh, it comes with its definition. And we, we and all other OEMs provide uh, their own implementation based on the application processor. That's the uh, camera subsystem. The top part, as you can see, is hardware independent. The bottom is very closely, uh, very closely related to uh, the hardware, and the hardware in which this case mostly involves the application processor, the image uh, processor, coprocessor, and the camera hardware or the image sensor itself. So just the process view. The camera service resides within the media service. Whenever there's a new application, it requests, it makes a request to access a camera over the binder interface. And if it has all the permissions, then the camera service will grant it permission. And it does this by creating a camera hardware object, which then makes system calls into the kernel to actually uh, uh, communicate with the hardware. 
There's always also a communication path from the uh, image sensor to the um, surface flinger or the display system for preview purposes. If there is a second application and it wants access to another camera object, that is typically granted. However, at a given time, only one application, one application can have access to one camera and uh, a given camera can be accessed by only one. So as a good, uh, from the application development perspective, to be a good citizen, whenever you, are, whenever you get into the pause state, you should release all your uh, handles to the camera. Inside the camera application, the only thing that's interesting here is the, uh, what's below the GNI. And um, this basically, uh, the thing that hasn't changed between camera one and camera two is that any frame, any uh, frame information, there is always a copy made from the native to the application space. And I think it's almost like a security thing here. You wouldn't want, for, for one of the um, use cases is a burst, right? Let, let's say we have an eight meg, um, uh, uh, sensor and we want to take two seconds of burst. Now, this becomes a problem then, right? Because if for eight, eight meg picture, let's say you compress it and you have like a two meg JPEG, you have to make copies if you want to return it to the application. And if it's running at 30 frames a second, it's a huge problem. There's a lot of memory copies doing away. So this again, Fall, highlights one of the limitations that are there. I still haven't seen within the re-architecture or solution to this problem, but maybe with the next version of Android, uh, something does come up. It also holds references to different objects, and uh, the callbacks are made uh, using this, uh, the GNI layer. So now moving on to camera service. So everything in the middle are the eye binder. Um, interfaces, the camera service is the libcamera-service.so, camera.h is the hardware interface, which whoever's providing the camera HAL will implement. Now this changes with 4.2. What we have here is that the lib camera service can now talk to two different interfaces, camera.h and camera2.h. And a given um, implement, a given device can have implementations of camera edge or camera 2.h. Now there is some glue classes um, that were discovered, which is camera 2 client and camera 2 device, which basically enables this lib camera service to talk both to camera .h and camera 2.h. Now let's try to understand a little bit more about what, what is this difference between the two. So this one I think I've um, covered. It's basically what does the camera service do? So one of the basic differences that happened between camera one and camera two was that in camera one everything was a, a function based, uh, the whole view of the image uh, sensor and the camera subsystem was function based take a picture, get, get the preview, set mode, and things like this. That has changed from an entirely streaming um, perspective. So there are different streams that are available at any given time. There's the preview stream, there's a capture stream, there's a callback stream. The ZSL stands for zero shutter lag. There's a recording stream. And it's all stream-based. So there's a steady stream, stream of information that is available from the sensor. So it, has, so it becomes more dynamic. You can insert different things. You can access different things. You can reprocess them. The camera 2 dot client, it uh, sits on top of the HAL, and it has different processors that run. These are the different processes. They talk to different streams. And Ashutosh will go over this in more detail when we start talking about the camera HAL implementation. The other thing is there's a big focus on metadata now. 
metadata of two kinds, static metadata, what are the capabilities of this camera? You don't have to open the, you don't have to open an instance of the camera to actually get that information. Uh, it can be, uh, the system can be queried um, statically. The other is, um, there is, uh, there is now uh, an attempt to minimize copies because, see, out of all the sensors that are available on a device compared to the accelerometer or the gyrometer, the most memory intensive sensor is the camera. And so there's a, an attempt to minimize the copies between, within the a native subsystem. The one that happens from native to application uh, for the uh, uh, Dalvik virtual machine, that still exists. But within it, there is a, an attempt to minimize the uh, number of memory copies. Metadata, there's two kinds of metadata, static and frame-based. Uh, the ones where, and if you open up the file, uh, I, have the, I have all the links at the end uh, in a, a couple of slides. It has the path to where you can open up the file and actually see. It has a whole list of tags. So the ones that are marked with underscore info are the static ones. The ones that don't have it, they're, typically you'll find like Android Flash and Android Flash info. The others are frame-based. So this frame, when it was taken, what was the Flash setting? And it comes bundled back with the frame information. And um, for all the OEMs in the room, there is provision to provide vendor-specific tags. So uh, if you want to do something to differentiate your stack, this is available. So earlier, just like the camera parameters pipe was available, is available to do settings to control the image sensor, the vendor-specific tags is, again, is another provision, a dumb provision to be able to actually provide uh, metadata back to the application layer. So now it's become like a two-way street instead of one way. These are all the directories. The only thing I have is the AV highlighted in yellow, which is where the paths change from ice cream sandwich to um, jelly bean. And the metadata that I was mentioning is the last line on this slide. So are there any questions? Sure. Uh, I will be emailing them uh, right after the, Perfect. yes, sure. And uh, feel free to get my contact information and we can communicate if there's any other information you would like in the future. So with that, I'd like to hand it over to Ashtosh. Thanks. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon to everybody. So I will be talking about the camera HAL in particular and all the layers that are underneath it. So basically it, is, it comprises of camera drivers, different configuration for the drivers, and then we will see some of the challenges that you will face while building up your HAL. <coughs> so this is the typical camera stack in the Android framework. You must have seen it so many times. So basically this block it's what is the, known as the camera HL, hardware abstraction layer. So every vendor has their own implementation of, the, of this abstraction layer, which basically depends upon the underlying hardware, the kind of SOCs which they are using, and the kind of camera hardware they are using. Okay, so we will be first talking about the changes which is undergone from ICS to JB, and we'll move, then we'll move to the camera driver. Uh, yeah, so this is the typical functionality of the camera HL. The, Camera hardware abstraction layer, it basically uh, is very specific, as I have already told you, it is very specific to the camera hardware platform and basically implemented by the vendors. So every vendor has their own proprietary HL, which provides, it basically maps the service calls, which is mandatory by the Google to the driver functions. It will get the functionality out of the driver. So uh, ice cream sandwich uses camera.h and jelly bean and above probably the next versions of jelly bean will use camera2.h and the camera hell also talks to the camera driver so basically there can be multiple flavors of driver available some of the most popular ones are v4l2 and openmax and on top of that vendors can have their own proprietary implementations of the driver just to just in case they don't want to expose the functionality <coughs> Excuse me. It communicates with the driver through the file I/O calls. So this is standard Linux I/O calls that they use to talk to the uh, to talk to the camera device. So this is 
So this is the functional camera HL diagram. That's, that's how the camera HL used to look like till ICS and the previous versions. So if you see the, the, the major functionalities of the camera HL is to manage the memory. It should know what kind of memory it is dealing with, what kind of, um, what kind of memory the camera hardware needs from it. Then it needs to manage the display surface in a way that the ultimate consumer for the camera buffers are the display surfaces. So it has to manage the equilibrium between the display and the camera. It basically needs to respond the events that it is getting from the driver and it also needs to generate the event for the application layer. And ultimately it has to manage the camera. So basically this is the camera manager which talks to the camera driver and uh, it. Yeah. This is how it looks uh, into the jelly. This is how it looks in the jelly bean. So if you have seen as my, uh, as Balvinder has already talked about it, previously the HL was more function based. So the, 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 the aim was to get a certain kind of stream. If you want to get a preview, you say start preview. If you want to take an image capture, you do, you, you do take picture and all these things. But now going forward, the Jelly Bean onwards, they are not viewing it as a piece of camera. They are viewing it as a, as a streams. So basically, the, the stream can be of multiple types. There can be preview stream, capture stream, and capture stream, post view stream, metadata stream, and potentially all of them running together at the same time. Okay? <coughs> metadata, as she, uh, she has already mentioned in her, uh, during her presentation, that nowadays focus is much more on metadata. It is the information, extra information associated with the image, which basically typically opens up the new horizon for creating some cool apps. So some of the typical metadata are like if you have face information, if you have some interest point information that you want to give out, give it out, and it can be stream specific or it can be camera specific, which can differ. The third thing which I think uh, they have uh, introduced is the reprocessing of the stream. So whatever the initial two block which we talked about deals with the live camera stream which is coming out of the sensor. Here in the case of reprocess stream, reprocess stream, we are talking about the stream that is in your memory that you just want to give it out for the reprocessing to do some other processing actually. Okay? And the stream manager is the guy who will talk to the camera driver here. So basically stream manager job is to manage the buffers, what kind of memory it requires and how it will get the, get the frames out of the camera driver. So this is the guy who will be uh, responsible of talking to the camera driver. So this is just uh, just to understand the functional and just to uh, see what who does what. So camera HL basically initializes all the different blocks which we have talked about, the stream manager and all of the guys. It basically dispatches all the function calls which it gets from the camera service to the respective blocks. Then the stream manager is the one who, who basically handles the streaming events, who gets its own buffers, who manages its own memory and it talks to the camera uh, hardware and also manages the state machine right from stream on to the stream off. Then metadata handler, the job of the metadata handler is acquire per shot metadata, get some uh, uh, interest points, all other things that is required, and convert them to the Android format and plumb it back and give it to the application layer. Reprocess stream manager, basically it sets up and manages the reprocess streams. So this is pretty much about the functionality. Changes, uh, what are the changes? that has uh, taken place since camera HL 1.0. So if you see, most of the camera HL 1.0 functionality has been moved to the service, lip camera service. You see the, the uh, camera to device and all these things have been moved to the camera service. <coughs> Image metadata has got more importance. So basically there is a different handler that is created specifically to get the metadata to, to open up the new horizons to create multiple applications. Reprocessing introduced, process an already captured image stream. Then, as I have told you before, this new HL is based on the streaming. It basically sees the, it basically generalizes the stream rather than on the function basis. So, as so, the camera HL one used to have start preview, take picture kind of functions, whereas in the camera HL two dot you will see that okay, allocate stream, start streaming and stop streaming kind of the functions. And every stream can, I mean, one of the stream can be preview stream, capture stream, and some of them or all of them may be, may be uh, running together. Okay, so this is again the same uh, diagram. So this is about the camera HL changes, 
what all the changes have been taking place from the HA, uh, camera HL 1.0 to 2.0. Now I will be talking about the driver, some of the, uh, some of the popular implementations of the driver and then we will see the challenges. <coughs> what is the driver, what, what the driver offers to the upper layer basically? So as you see that there are multiple companies that are involved in this camera hardware creating that image sensor and all other things. So basically the camera driver represents a standardized interface for the, for the HAL and the above layers to access the camera hardware. The, the imager specific or camera hardware specific attributes are handled at the lower layer of the driver. So the driver has two parts, one is very generalized and basically, uh, basically exposed API to the, to the top layer and there is one which is very, very specific to the imager hardware that takes care of the actual camera hardware. So right now there are, there are multiple types of sensors available. Some of them are raw sensors which will give out the bare image which needs to be processed through the ISP. Now this ISP are ISP models very uh, this thing. ISPs are offered by OEMs, the platform vendors or there are some smart sensors which have the ISP on the chip. So you get all the, the processed image and you don't require the platform ISP which is available with the, uh, with the application processor. So this, kind, this difference is basically handled at the driver level whether you want to bypass the ISP or you want to use the ISP for processing the bare image and get the YUV image or something out of uh, your system. For Android, video for Linux 2 is used in many implementations. It has been in existence for many years and uh, I mean recently it is going and it is undergoing some changes to uh, accommodate the new interest and to accommodate the finer control over the hardware blocks as the hardware is getting more complex. OpenMax is the another one which is getting popular, which is getting popular and it also is being used to control the camera hardware. <coughs> this is the V4L2 kernel level the block diagram. So if you see what it offers to the to the top layer is basically a generalized way to access the device. It uh, supports IOPTEL dispatch and this is, uh, this is the, the controlling interface for the V4L2. It basically controls the buffer management and it also controls the camera hardware, right? So when we talk about the buffer management control, so what it does is it depends upon the camera hardware requirement. It either, it either allocates the memory, what is the physically contiguous memory that is required by, by your camera it manages the buffer and so basically the buffer, so there are, there you create a buffer pool and you will be re reusing the pools. You will fill the buffer, then you will give it to the HL for processing. Once HL is done with that, then HL can queue, uh, queue it back to your, uh, to your driver. So we call this as a QDQ mechanism. So it maintains that, it maintains the various states of the buffer. Buffer needs to go to multiple stages before it is ready for the consumption. Apart from that, it also manages the hardware, camera hardware. So basically, it, it has the infrastructure to do the device discovery as it's been done for the most of the Linux devices, device initialization. Then it has the, uh, it talks to the device through the I2C to get device specific parameters. And if you want to do some specialized settings for some specialized registers, then it also takes care of the power management. So basically, when, when you switch off it, it uh, switch off the power, it basically takes the sensor into the low power states, uh, some of them the standby modes or complete power of state based on your design. Then it also enable and disable image streaming which helps you to get the streaming out of the, the camera. Some of the resources, some of the important resources which V4L2 has or any camera driver for that matter has. So basically. Memory, as I have told you, memory can either be allocated at the driver level if you are need, if you are in the need of physical contiguous memory, or there are some of the intelligent hardware that are that are present now, which can do the, which basically avoids you to use the physically contiguous memory because it's very expensive. So it depends upon the kind of hardware that you are using. Then it needs to support for the interrupts. It needs to handle interrupts such as frame and interrupt you know, and, and autofocus interrupt or frame start or frame finish. So there, are a, there, are, there are a number of interrupts. You can choose what interrupts you want to service, okay? Some of them which is very essential is frame finish, where your frame is ready for the consumption, and your focus events, 
whether at what stage of focusing you are at and whether you have completed the focus or not. Camera hardware control, so normally the camera hardware is connected on the peripheral buses such as I square C and uh, SPI. So I square C, I square C is the most popular one, still it is being used to control the maximum number of camera hardwares. SPI is the faster alternative to it. Uh, and there are GPIOs again, GPIOs are basically used to connect the reset pins and all other standby interfaces for the camera hardware. Then it manages the sensor power, sensor, sensor power as I have told you that right now power management and peripherals power is of utmost importance in, in the any, any handheld devices. So basically it supports, uh, it, it based on the device uses, it puts the device into the low power mode and ultra low power modes. When, I mean, whenever it is desired. Yeah. <coughs> okay. This is this talks about uh, more about the buffer management. So in the Linux, uh, in the V4L2, one or more buffers has, are supported. As I have told you, the buffers either can be allocated in the driver space or based on the hardware, you can use the buffers that are allocated in the user space also. Buffers are queued in the circular list, so you will be reusing the buffers. So whenever a buffer, whenever, so basically the starting of the streaming and ending of the streaming are the ones which basically uh, starts the process of filling the buffer. So when you call stream on, the buffers which is at the top of the circular queue is being taken out and is being filled with the camera data and camera HL, once it, once it is filled, camera HL dequeues it, it processes the buffer and it use the buffer back again to the driver so the buffer becomes available again for the for for acquiring the data and suppose if you are done with your imaging when you want to switch off the camera you just need to call the stream off command it basically stops the streaming and it 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 uh, uh, releases all the buffers that it, that it is uh, holding right now so this is just the call sequence of uh, what are the calls that you have to uh, follow in the V4L2 framework to get the preview out. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional. So I guess uh, uh, let's just concentrate on some of the ones which is uh, important. So first thing is uh, set format, set format. So here you set the image format and the size. Here you say that okay, what kind of uh, color format that you are dealing with and what will be the frame sizes. And I guess cropping, if you want to set the cropping, if you want to crop the image, uh, then you just set the cropper parameters or it is optional, you can just leave it out. Then you do the request buffers, you need to tell the V4L2 how many buffers you will be using and V4L2, you have to set what kind of video memory is available to you, to the, to the driver. Based on it, it will, it will say whether your request can be completed or not. So suppose, uh, so request buffer you have to do, this is mandatory. So when you are, suppose the buffers are allocated in the kernel space, in the, in the driver, then you want to get the buffer attributes into the user space for your programming, then you need to do query buff. You, so query buff will return you the buffer characteristics. <coughs> and since the buffers are located in the kernel, you definitely want to map them to be able to use them in the user space. So that's why you do a map here. And finally, once you get all the buffer details and everything, you need to queue them explicitly to the driver. So you say uh, video buff, video IC queue buff. And once you have queued all of them, then you want, you will start, you will do stream on finally. Stream on will basically start the streaming process. It will enable the Rx, it will enable the Rx actually. <coughs> once you are done with the streaming, once you are done with the camera, you just gonna say stream off. It will just stream, it will stop the streaming and it will deallocate all the buffers which it has. Okay, so as I have told you that, uh, so the, this V4L2 framework is quite old. Uh, it has uh, basically, it is, I, th I guess it is eight to nine years old. And initially when it was built, the camera was only supposed to do preview and some of the captures. But today camera is, uh, is basically, you know, a camera is supposed to do much more than just, pre just viewfinder and just uh, image capturing. And uh, moreover, the imaging hardware, the ISPs are getting more and more smarter. There are more and more IPs are getting added to it. And to get the maximum out of the camera, the users are demanding finer control because there are multiple paths that can be available and you can 
you can decide which paths you want your data to pass through for processing to get the desired use case uh, done. So keeping this in mind, I think they are, they are uh, the, the V4L2 community, basically they are uh, coming up with this media, they have come up with this media control architecture. <coughs> As, so it is designed to support dynamically reconnecting, reconnectable hardware blocks. Connection should be there in the hardware, but so there can be a situation where one block can get inputs from multiple sources and can output to multiple sources. So it will help you in creating your own pipeline with, with a particular source and with a particular uh, sync. It allows for greater programmer control. It introduces the notion of entities, pads and links. Uh, so basically your hardware block is the entity here and you, if whatever you are seeing is the pads. So pads are the way, uh, are the way through which the entity talks to the outer world. Okay? So there can be input pads and there can be output pads based on the devices it can be get connected to or it is connected to in the hardware. You have those many number of pads but in the given pipeline you have only one input and one output pad active. Okay? <coughs> so this is just a uh, example what I have taken and it has been taken from OMAP3 ISP uh, which is a pretty similar uh, simple one. So if you see that <coughs> this is the sensor MT9P031 sensor and the, the sensor is being, uh, is being, uh, is, uh, is being uh, enumerated as an entity and it has got a source pad attached to it. The CCDC is the parallel interface, parallel image interface of OMAP3. Of OMAP3. So <coughs> the sensor is connected to the OMAP3 through the parallel interface. So if you see that the sensor has the source pad and the CCDC has the sync pad, right? So the data that is coming out of the sensor is going to the CCDC, right? Now there is a choice you can make, right? So suppose if you don't want to do any processing, if you don't uh, want to do anything, then you can control, you can, you can program your pipeline for the data to flow from the sensor to the CCDC and this is a video zero node that is nothing but your memory, so directly to the memory. Okay, this is one of the one of the configurations that you can program. Now, suppose if you want to do resizing or you want to do other stuff, there are a lot of stuff. I have just taken one of one resizer block as an example. Suppose if you want to do if you want to resize also, then you can choose this alternate path where CCDC this thing will be will act as a source pad. It will feed to the resizer and the resizer output definitely will finally get into the memory. So, like this, uh, you there there is a term known as entity graph. Okay. So you user will have the entity graphs where, where you can have the, the connections of the blocks possible based on the use cases. So for the bus mode photography, you want one way. For the other, other shots, you want other way. So it, it, it all depends upon the use cases, but it gives the final control. Yeah, so uh, when you bring up the camera hell or when you write your own camera hell, some of the things which you need to take care of, which you need to take care, uh, let, let's just talk about that. I think the first and foremost is the memory management. Since the camera HL is the one who will be talking to the driver and will be basically, you know, uh, basically <coughs> getting the buffers and you know giving it to the display for the consumption. So it should be aware of the the kind of memory the camera requires and the display requires. And suppose if there is no match, then it needs to do copy or something like that. So, it, so camera HL, when you are writing the camera HL, you should be aware of what kind of memory your camera hardware requires and what kind of memory your platform requires. Okay. Various implementations of camera driver. So as we have already discussed, V4L2 is one of the implementations by which you can, impl you can have your camera driver implemented. OpenMax is another one and some of the vendors have their own proprietary ones. And this big gains an importance because in the, in the scenario of multiple cameras, front and back, one of them can get implemented by V4L2. Another one, you can use the proprietary one or you can use the uh, open max one. So camera HL needs to be aware of this. Color format conversion, there can be multiple color format. The sensor can give out uh, different color format. Display may expect the another one. So camera HL may need to do the color conversion, either using the hardware block or the software block. Buffer synchronization, as I have told you, the ultimate consumer of the camera buffers is uh, display surface and so normally the buffers are shared just to save the memory. So camera HL needs to manage the buffers in a synchronized manner to avoid overrun and underrun of the buffers. 
then support for advanced features. The basic camera HAL with what the Android offers will support only the bare minimum features. If you want to have some kind of the differentiating features, then you got to support it in your camera, either by the Android extension or in to in, in implement the whole interface. So are all camera HLs equal? The answer is no. And in what way it differs? So basically, <coughs> supported feature depend on the hardware capabilities. I mean, the lot of function that can be enabled only if your hardware supports it. Then <coughs> also the way you implement it in the camera health, there may need there may be a need to integrate third party IPs to get the functionality done. So it all depends how you program it and how you use it in your camera health. Performance, again reliability, and finally how how easily you can add extensions to the Android feature set to get your uh, other features done. I think with this, uh, I think uh, that's all I have to talk about. And probably Banvinder will talk about some of the latest trends uh, in the camera thing. And, and probably then we'll take some questions, OK? Yeah. I guess we're running out of time. Yeah, so um, we have a little bit of time. But uh, I did, we did cover most, we did, uh, cover most of um, uh, what we're saying. So some of the things, computer vision applications, we're finding a lot of um, interest, uh, object tracking, gesture recognition, augmented reality, uh, computational photography where people can do things. I mentioned HDR, uh, flash, no flash, different hyper focus, lots of different things. So basically the output there will be uh, even better image quality on um, devices. Uh, 3D imaging is another thing that um, sometimes gains a lot of interest and wanes. I've seen uh, uh, things there, but where you use multiple um, uh, cameras to create a 3D image. And uh, yes, yeah, so I did mention this. This was something that I found this morning where uh, the uh, VP of uh, uh, Google, Vic Gondotra, mentioned on Google Plus last night that uh, beware of the next, uh, the next Nexus will have a very uh, insanely great camera, just you wait and see. But what does it mean? Um, I guess we'll just wait and see, because <laughs> that's about as much information as I have. And uh, we're ready to take um, any uh, questions that you may have.